Peace and blessings, sis. How you doing? <clears throat> I thought he was sitting right here. No, no, you sit there. Mm -hmm. You sit right here. Mm -hmm. Can they see both of us? Other than this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I gotta put the Bible thing up. Just the beginning. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You haven't seen your best days yet. You gotta move your elbow so I can see. <laughs> oh, you can't see? Oh, I was kicked up. Wasn't <laughs> no, you don't gotta turn it all the way over. No, now I'm all the way in the camera. There you go. This is. <laughs> Let me help you get to my scripture because you don't read mine, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Peace and blessings, everybody. How's everybody doing? God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta read the scripture. Mm -hmm. God can. <clears throat> Amen. Peace and blessings, everybody. Brother Moses here, my beautiful, lovely wife, Regina. <laughs> um, we're coming to you today. Another Bible study, another prophetic periscope. I pray that it speaks into your life. I pray that it gives you perspective. I pray that it helps you in your walk with God. I pray that it empowers you to do that which is pleasing in the eyes and sight of God. <clears throat> Pray that it helps you be more effective in ministry. Um, I share it out of the humbleness of our heart. We share it out of the humble of our heart. Not in esteeming ourselves to be greater than anyone or no more than anyone, but you know, at the very best, just trying to do that which we believe God would have us to do. And I pray it is it's received in that way and that it will be a blessing to your very life. Amen. Can everyone see us? Are we glitching? Can everyone hear us? Hard if you can hear. Amen. Thank you. So we want to talk to you about, I think what I title this, or oh, it's not as it appears. It's not as it appears. So Regina is going to praise God. She's going to share a little bit of something that the Lord placed on her heart. I'm excited to hear it, and then I'm going to share a little bit of something on my heart. We're not going to be before you very long. Uh, we pray that what is said to be sown into the deepest rest recesses of your spirit, that if we sow into the spirit, we may reap of the spirit life eternal. Amen. We go up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for another day. 
We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity, Lord. We bless you. We love you. We appreciate your grace, your mercy, your love, your kindness, your gentleness, your righteousness, even your correction, God. You are a holy God. You are worthy to be praised, and we salute you. We speak blessings over you, Lord. We just love on you today at this moment and worship you for who you are and what you have done in our lives. Father, I ask that you would be in the midst of this fellowship, this Bible study, that your favor and blessing would be upon us. That you would move by your spirit, Lord God, and cause every word to be spoken, to be saturated by your anointing, to destroy yokes and lift burdens, to open eyes that they may see, to open deaf ears that they may hear, God, to cause the lame to be able to walk, Father God, by faith. I pray that it would empower some, encourage others, and provoke another, Lord God. Just have your way. We yield this service unto you, Holy Spirit, to lead, to guide. I pray that there's a spirit of liberty here to liberate your people, God, to be free, God, to be free to receive, to free to worship, free to move by faith, God, free to do that which is pleasing in your eyesight without worrying about man, God. Just continue to have your way in our lives. And we will be ever mindful to give you the honor, glory, and praise. Amen. 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 So without further ado, I'll give it over to Regina. <clears throat> so you want to read the scripture first? Or? No, I'll tell you when I'm ready. So Mo has shared something uh, a couple weeks ago about, he said that um, your wilderness is someone else's garden. So I just want to encourage somebody who that who may be going through their wilderness experience right now. Sometimes I feel like, dang God, I'm always going through. Like, I'm hurting. This don't feel good. I feel like I'm always going through. And you might just be in your wilderness season. But I want to encourage you that, you know, when you're going through your wilderness experiences, that it's a, it can be a blessing to somebody else. You know, sometimes you feel like I'm going through, I'm hurting. But when you come through it, you might encounter somebody who has that same, you know, um, experience or, you know, a similar experience that you may have gone through it or whatever. So you could be a blessing to that other person, you know. Sometimes I know that once when Mo was incarcerated, I told God, like, if I got to go through this, because God was encouraging me at that time that it's not just for me. Like what I'm going through wasn't just for me. So I told God that if I'm going to go through it and I have to go through it, then I want to go through it the right way so that I can help the woman who was going to need my story once I came out of it. So he said that your garden, I mean, your wilderness was somebody else's garden. So a wilderness is an empty place, a barren place, a place of solitude, you know, um, stuff can't really last in the wilderness In the wilderness is where you know, a lot of stuff is being uprooted from your flesh. Some stuff is dying in the wilderness. But in the garden, it's a place of um, growth where plants grow, fruit grows. You know, so I said, well, how can my wilderness be somebody else's garden? Because I'm, I'm dying in the wilderness. How can it be somebody else's garden? How can where I'm at be a place where somebody else is growing and um, fruit is growing and they bearing fruit? bearing forth much fruit and what what God showed me was my wilderness I'm getting you know I'm by myself but I'm I'm being uh, made new really you know some old stuff is being released from my life or whatever but now I got answers for you in your garden you know Amen. in your garden you don't you don't have you're not blinded you know you're not just going through it, trying to figure stuff out or whatever. There's answers there. I got answers for you in your garden. So you're not um, struggling or stumbling in, in this garden. And you, you're able to bear forth much fruit in your garden because I went through it. And some of the stuff that I've gone through, you don't have to go through it in your garden. So there's there's good stuff for you to, um, to, to get from my experiences, from my wilderness experience. So I want to say like, you know, I had shared at the tea party that I don't have to go through by myself. It was a one woman that I had shared with before, like, you know, our lives were kind of similar, you know what I mean? But she was kind of at the beginning of where I once was with my relationship with Mo or, you know, having 
been through certain places in my life. She was at the beginning of where I had already been. So I told her, you know, I you don't have to go through every single thing, every single thing that I've gone through. There's some stories that you don't have to have. There's some, you know, tests that you don't have to take because I already went through it. You know, I've already been in that wilderness. And now this is a place for her garden because there's certain things I got answers to. You know, there's answers for her in this place. She's going to be able to bear forth much fruit because she don't have to go through it how I went through it. I've gone through it. Um, Griffin, come back. I need you to read my scripture now. <laughs> so Moses had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Right? And then Joshua came after Moses couldn't go into the promised land. He didn't do everything how God said he was going to supposed to do it. So he couldn't go to the promised land. So he died before the people could go into the promised land. So I want to read um, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. It say, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to thee, even to the children of Israel. You left me. <laughs> Every place that the sole of your foot should tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Now listen. Uh, praise God. Got me reading. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There's he said, from the wilderness, like God is telling Joshua about the where he was taking the people. He was Joshua was supposed to take the people into the promised land. So God told him, from the wilderness and all of these other places, read, <laughs> reread it. <laughs> Verse 4, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Shall be your coast. So my wilderness was meant to be your garden. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I, you know, how does that connect to, it's not as it appears to be, you know? You know, sometimes God plants us. Matthew 13, when Jesus gave the parable of a sower that sowed seed, and then he said the enemy came behind that person and sowed seeds in his field. When Jesus described the parable, he said that the seed are the children of the kingdom. So God strategically sows us in certain places for a certain purpose. In any time, God, God doesn't sow in vain. The Bible says God is not mocked. We reap what we sow. So God, you know, God's way is never mocked. It, it's, it's never, it always works in this way is basically what it's saying. That you will reap what you sow because God also lives by the same principle. So God sows something and he says that I send my word and I do not expect it return unto me void. I expect it to bring forth something. So when God sow you or sow a word into you or sow an anointing into you and then sow you in a situation, sow you in an experience, sow you in, an, in a ministry, sow you in an environment, like sow you in a job, he expect that there will be a return on him sowing you. He expect that there will be some type of fruit of the kingdom produced in your situation. Right? And so it is also true of Joshua and, and Moses. And so it is also true of Abraham. God had Abraham travel in different places. But Abraham had the seed or the blessing upon him. You know, and wherever he went, he himself was a seed. And God said, wherever your feet will tread upon, I will give you that land as an inheritance. So oftentimes, God sow you in a place that seemed, God, why am I going through this? Because God expect you to, God expects that through you, that wilderness experience will become 
a promised land will become a place of fruitfulness. So it's not always as it appears to be. God isn't allowing you to go through things because he doesn't like you or because he's cashed you off. Like, no, he's sowing you into something. He's sowing you in a situation that you can reap a victory and other people can receive the fruit of that victory because of it. And, you know, and continuing that same things, of, same theme of things are uh, as they appear. I wanted to talk to you guys about images. I wanted to talk to you guys about images. And I'm going to be very briefly, probably like 10 minutes. Images. You know? <laughs> images are very important to God. Image, image is very important to God. Now... In 1 Samuel, right? In 1 Samuel, when the prophet came to anoint the king, you know, I believe it's 1 Samuel, either 16 or 17. But when the prophet, you know, when he was looking for a king, he was looking by the appearance of things. He was looking for a king with his eye. So everyone that he would think to be a king you know, God said, no, I have not chosen this individual. No, I have not chosen this individual. So God reminded the prophet that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Now, I want to say this because oftentimes we quote this to justify the fact that in spite of how we're living or what we're participating in, God can still receive us because he knows the intent of our heart is not malicious in nature. And that is also true. And then we take it a step further, especially when we first come into this walk with Christ, you know. We, we, we feel so free and so liberated in Christ. And we're all about Jesus, you know, that we don't want any extra, any, any extraness that clouds our relationship and connection with Christ. You're like, man, it's all about Christ, which it is. I ain't worried about nothing else. People doing this in the church. People worrying about all this other stuff. It's about Christ. And that is very true. But I have made the mistake in times past of trying to force people to accept me and how I present myself because God is not worried about my outward appearance that he only concerned about my heart. So I would go to church with fitted caps on and everything, dress how I used to dress, you know, with baggy pants and, you know, I, you know, not dressing up in what we call, quote unquote, church clothes or our Sunday's best. I'm like, man, I'm going to be regular. That stuff don't matter. It shouldn't matter. Only your heart. I love Jesus. That stuff doesn't matter. That was my heart. That, you know, that's just where I was at in the faith at that time. And I will always quote the scripture of how God judges the heart. You know, man focus on the appearance of things. And this is true. But as I begin to mature in the Lord, what I realize is that that not only is God speaking of that, how he doesn't just judge by the appearance of things, that the intents of the heart, but God is also imparting to us wisdom about how to carry ourselves. He's giving us wisdom and insight. He's letting us know that man judges things by the appearance of things and as you mature in christ you know you know wherever you may be praise god but i speak for myself as i was a little bit more immature in the things of god i did not care what man thought you know i don't i don't care but as i begin to mature in christ i begin to understand by that how man sees it is important like it's important you know what a person thinks about it is important. When I was immature, I'd be like, man, it's only what God thinks. That's all that matters. I don't care about nothing else. But for me, that was a place of immaturity. Because as I mature, I understand that not only is what God feels about something the most important, but how this other individual feels about that is also important. You know, we, we say that as if how that person feels or sees it is not important to God. If it's important to God, then it's important. If this person's perspective or where they are in their life is important to God, if their opinions is important to God, 
or how they think about things is important to God, which they are. Like, if, if these things weren't important to God, then God wouldn't say, cast your cares unto me because I care for you. I mean, not everything God is saying, whatever concerns you, I'm concerned about. Okay? Now, I'm saying that because God was giving us wisdom and help us how to be effective in the ministry. He's saying, listen, I need you to understand that man, they judge things by appearance. We know that people always say that the first impression is a lasting impression. So you want to make the first the, the best first impression that you can. Well, that in essence, that's exactly what God is saying. God is saying, man, always going to draw a conclusion about you, about what you're doing, about how you, whatever's going on by how things appear. Now, this is not the... <laughs> this is not demonic in nature. This is actually godliness. This is actually godliness because God is the one that created the forum in which people judge things by appearance. Now, I'm going to tell you how. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says that when God created something, when God created man, how did he create us? Genesis chapter 1 says that God said, let us make man or mankind, because he made male and female, made he them as man. Let us make them, which is both of them, in our image, which is the divine image of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and even the Elohim or the heavenly host or the angels. <clears throat> he said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Okay? So one denotes the actual makeup of our being. We have a head, two ears, two eyes. That's the likeness. But when we're made in the image of God, it's talking about the character. The word image actually means a, a, a mental picture or reflection. When you take a picture, that picture is known as a what? Image. The, the picture is not the actual person, but they show you what the person looks like. So God created us in his image, which means that we are supposed to be a picture of what he looks like. We are supposed to be a reflection. We are not him, but we are supposed to give a mental picture. People should draw up what God looks like by how we look. Because we are the image or the what? Picture or the or the drawing of God himself. God is an unseen entity. Even if when you go to heaven, you will never see God. You can't see God at all. God manifested him, manifest himself in forms that are visible. That's how we got the what we call the triune God or the Godhead. Those are the clear manifestations of God himself. But Jesus declared that no one can see God ever. He said no one has seen God at any time. Because God in his purest form is spirit that cannot be seen. Okay? Jesus said that we can see the Father. But he said that no one has seen God at any time. Now, we can discuss that. And you know, there's a lot of scriptures that we can reconcile. Because people declare that they have seen God. Jesus himself, you know, also taught that in the Beatitudes. Blessed is the pure in heart for they will see God. So, you know, we, we will have to, you know, go into a study and discuss in context what these things mean. Like, you know, when he said, blessed and pure heart, that they will see God, you know, he's not saying with the physical eye. He's saying perceive or understand the reality of who God is. To be conscious of God, to see with the third eye, which is your consciousness. To be conscious and be aware of the presence and the reality of God. But when Jesus said no man has seen God, it's because God cannot be seen with an eye. You understand? That's what it, you know, you got to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is speaking. You can't physically see God ever. Because in his purest form, he's an invisible spirit. Okay? So, <laughs> amen. I don't know if I got off track. So when the Bible says that God 
God wanted to God wants to have relationship with all of his creation. So to do that, he he manifests himself in relatable form, like, okay? And he created us in his image and likeness to create the form in which we can have relationship. The essence and the foundation of relationship is the point where two people relate. It's a relationship. You understand? So God created relation with us by making us just like him. Okay? He created that connection. But also, he wanted his creation to be able to identify with the unseen God. So he created man in his image and likeness. And man was, you know, stood in the gap and created the connection between God and his creation. Because man was the, the picture or the image or the reflection of what God looks like. So God created a form where people draw conclusions in their mind based off what things look like. Because God chose to reveal himself not in just conversation, not just with the, the language of words. God chose to reveal himself through the language of pictures, like through the language of images. God said, I must show the world myself through an image. God said that I speak to the prophets through visions and dreams. In other words, God said, I communicate to people by showing them a picture of me. So God is the one that created that form where image is important. Image always communicates something like, you know, as much as we try to get away from prejudices and stuff like that, the way you carry yourself communicates something to people. Like we say, you know what? God only care about your heart. Well, if that's the truth, why does God go through great detail to instruct the people how to dress over and over? If you read the law, God, God went through great detail to um, instruct the priests on how they should dress and what they should dress exactly. God told the people what not to wear and what to wear. He said that a woman should not wear men's garment and men should not wear women's garment. You shouldn't wear clothes with holes in them. You shouldn't mix linen. Why does he go through great detail to instruct us on what we should wear? Because he know that people judge things by images like. And that image is important. God chose to reveal himself through image. The Bible says in Hebrews that in God in times past, Hebrews chapter 1, spoke by the law and the prophets. Let me get it. It's Hebrews chapter 1. It says, God, who has sun-dry times and in divers manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus is the express picture of what God looks like. That's why Jesus said in John 14, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. Many have not seen the father. It's the son's responsibility to declare what the father looks like. It's the son's responsibility to reflect the father. You understand? So Jesus is the image of God. Okay? He is the image of God. That's why he was constantly saying, if you see me, you've seen the Father. It's the Father in me that said these things. It's the Father in me that doing these works. He knew that he was just an image to reflect the Father. And that's why we call Jesus God. Because God is in him. Like, Amen? And he is the image of God. And he, when you look at Jesus, who do you see? What comes to mind? Like, who does Jesus remind you of? God. Okay? So image is very important to God. It's very important. 
in so much that what's in your heart will manifest as an image. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And when it says, so is he, it's talking about a, a, that a, a, um, a seen reality is created by the imaginations of his heart. Okay? As a man thinketh or imagines in his heart or meditates. Jesus said, if you imagine to do something in your heart, then you've already done it. It becomes a true reality. Okay? That you manifest. Okay? So image is very important. How we carry ourselves is very important to God. I don't care how anointed you are. If you have a ministry, and I've learned this the hard way, if things is chaotic and out of order, I don't care how anointed you are, it's going to be, it makes it hard for people to receive it. Like, how you carry yourself, it can make things easier for people to receive your ministry, like, or what God has truly given you. Now, you can say, you know what, I don't care how people, God told me, so I'm just going to do it. You can do that, and that's okay. You can be justified in doing that. But but we can excel in wisdom and understand that there's a way that I can present things. There's a way that I can present things, okay? We're talking about images. It's, there's a way that I can present it and things can have the right appearance to where it's easier for people to receive. Like, I can carry myself in such a way. For instance, I'd be like, listen, I'm going to be the only preacher with, with a fitted cap and Jordans. Because I know God called me. He told me this. And people just got to receive it. Because God said it. That's how I used to feel. But God humbled me. See that was pride. Because God saying listen. Humble yourself. Like, even, if, even if they're wrong. Because they want you to dress a certain way. And all of that. Jesus, the Lord was like. Isn't it more important for them to receive the message. Why you just can't put a suit on so that it's easier for them to receive? If you could put a suit on and make it easier for these people to receive it, then why are you not willing to do that? What are you trying to prove? Like, And once he opened my mind to that, I started thinking differently. Like, You know, I started thinking a, a little bit more humbly and not so prideful. Like, listen, God told me, so you just got to accept it. Just how I'm going to do it, and I don't care what you think. I started to mature and I started to take into consideration how people think and feel so that I can present what God has given me in a way that's easier for them to receive. Now, you're not going to always be able to do it. Some, in some situations, people are just not going to receive it, period, no matter how you try to present it. I used to be like, man, God told me, amen, this is what it is. Then I realize, you know, if I could bring it a little bit more gentle and present it in a more gentle gentle fashion, if it's easier for them to receive it, then I'll do that. See, it's all about the appearance of things like, okay, image is important. Now, image is so important. It says this. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures and I'm going to be done. Probably five, ten minutes. Romans chapter eight. And we know, this 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to the purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So God want us to be conformed. God want us to be formed and have the, the form of something. Like, why? Because he want our life to look like something. He want, you know... What God taught me is that when something is without form, it doesn't have identity. It doesn't have an image. You know? So when he put form to it, he give it an image. It says here that he predestined us to be conformed to what? An image of his son. He has it us he didn't he, he has it predestinated. Our destiny is not looking like a denomination, looking Pentecostal, looking Jewish, looking this. Our, our destination is looking like Christ. And we and all these different denominations and perspective, they're members of the body. So they all have one key component to who Jesus is. But all of us together, we make up the entirety of who Jesus is. Okay? So God is using these things to get us to be more like Christ or look or have the image or the reflection of who Jesus is. 
Well, how do you know what image that you're carrying? I'll ask you, what image are you carrying? We'll all say, well, I'm carrying the image of Christ. I'm the image of God. Well, my next question is, amen, you are the image of God. But are you reflecting that? What image are you reflecting? You know? The indication is that what comes to mind when when you when people think of you, because that's that's gonna tell what you're reflecting. Like, do people think of the world when they look at you? When they do, people think of a hypocrite when they think of you. Do people think of a sinner when they think of you? Do people think about God when they think of you? When they think, do they think about the power of God when you come to mind? Because if people think about God and think about the power of God when they think about you, then that means that you're reflecting or you're shining the brightness of who Jesus is. Unfortunately, we don't always reflect that, but God is conforming us. He's forming us and he's molding us into that image because image is important. God uses image to communicate something. So how we appear you know, I get on Periscope looking halfway crazy, face looking crazy, and I just want people to receive what I'm saying. But my appearance is important. Like When you go to the job interview, you don't go looking half any old type of way. But why do we feel it's okay to do that to God? Like, Why, why do we feel it's okay to go to church looking any old kind of way? You go on before God. You wouldn't do that in a job interview. You don't do that on your job. You make sure that you look the part. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to act the part, walk the walk, talk the talk. He wants us to look the part as well. Like He wants us to look the part. People not broke in the kingdom of God. People not sick in the kingdom of God. That's why God going to be prospering us. That's why God going to be moving in supernatural miracles. Because he wants us to look like the kingdom of God. The Bible says that we're the seed of the kingdom. So if God plant us a certain place, then he ex his desire is for us to reflect the kingdom of God. Goes back to my wife's point. She said that, you know, God will turn your, your wilderness can be a wilderness for you, but it can turn into a garden of Eden for someone else. Okay. Why am I saying that? You know, things aren't as they appear, you know. God sold you into a difficult situation, but he want you to reflect the kingdom of God. So we keep complaining and murmuring. You're not reflecting the kingdom of God. You're not reflecting Christ. We're moving in pride and selfishness and isolating. We're not reflecting the light of the world. We're not reflecting Christ. We're not giving people a mental picture of what God is like. You're in this situation that you do not want to be in. It's not your final destination. But God has, pre your, part of your destiny is to reflect who Jesus is. It's to show forth the image of God. So what image are you reflecting? Romans 13 tell us to what? Put on Christ. It's interesting that he uses the terminology of the character of Christ as a garment. Because what you wear is important. Like how you present yourself how you carry yourself, how you present what God has given you is important. You talk about you anointed, but you but you overweight and you're looking like a glutton. Like you talk about you a man of God, but you don't never cut. You, you, you're not trimmed up. You look any old type of way. You carry yourself bummy. Like this is not of God. Like, you know, God wants us to look the part, dress the part, carry ourselves the part. God wants us to be prosperous, reflecting the kingdom. God wants us to be shining inside and out. It's just what I believe. Because God uses image to communicate something about himself. Amen. Now my final scripture, you want to think about Solomon. And I don't have this. I'm not even going to try to look for the scripture. But when Solomon built the temple, he built the temple. It was so beautiful. It was built of solid gold and silver and precious stones like. He gave God his best. He built the best. His servants was in order. Everything was in order. Everything was in line. Everything was beautiful and glamorous to the eye, to the appearance of things. In so much that when the queen of Sheba came to see what Solomon had built, the Bible says that she basically passed out 
by the appear the Bible says that she she passed out from the glory of what Solomon built and she had no spirit in her life. That means that what Solomon built was so glorious it took her breath away. And it actually God was able to do something inside of her. She was able to get a revelation about God through the appearance of what Solomon built. So image is important. Your image, how you appear, how your house appear, how your car appear like. You know, God want to use our whole life to communicate something, not just our words. So you trying to tell somebody about the goodness of God, but your, your car look like a pig pen. And I'm talking to myself first. That's why God gave us that message last year. Clean your car up once a week. God said, man, God don't want our life to be trifling. God don't want us to look trifling. You talk about you anointed, but your house a mess. Your whole, your whole house out of order. How does that reflect a, a God that's a God that, that does things in decency and order? How does your house being out of order reflect a God that's all about order? It doesn't reflect God. It doesn't reflect the reality of God in your life. Now, I'm not saying that God is not in your life. But it'd be easy for a person to make a judgment that how real is God in your life if your life looked like this? You're not even disciplined right. You understand? So it's just in my heart to talk about image. Image is important in God to God. You know? What are we reflecting? You know? Who are we reflecting? Pray that this message help you, encourage you, inspire you, bless you. I believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Um, Father, I pray that, you know, you create us in your image and likeness. You're building us to be more like Jesus, to be the light of the world. And I'm asking, Lord God, that whatever situation that we are in, that as seeds or children of the kingdom, we will reflect your son. That the image that we would reflect to the world will be that of divinity, God will be that of humility, will be that of love, sacrifice, giving, grace, peace, and mercy, the fruits of the Spirit, God. We may be in adverse situations that we do not want to be in, and it may be even so that you don't even want us to be in, but you sow us and you plant us in situations to be a light. To show the world something or allow people to see something in us. I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace to never destroy that witness in the name of Jesus. Lead us by your spirit, Father. If this word is of you, I'm asking that you would convict some of this word, that you would bring it into their remembrance, that you would give them revelation in light of this word in the name of Jesus. Bless everyone, Father God. Bless them. Give them peace, fill them with joy, God. Let them rest in this peace in the name of Jesus. Remove all stress, anxiety, and fear. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And I'm asking that you would fill them up with your presence and your Holy Spirit. And I know that your grace is sufficient in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Peace and blessings, family. Love y'all.